maybe on the deals. Right. Sorting and aggregate. Um, so it sort of goes without saying, uh, you know, it should be sort of obvious why we need to sort. Um, you know, the, the relational model has no ordering, so so the the user might say in their in their SQL query, give me an order by, and therefore we have to sort it. Um, but as we'll see as, as we go along, there can be other scenarios where certain algorithms or operators can be implemented more efficiently by sorting, even though the user didn't ask us to sort. So even though there was an explicit order by clause, if we sort our tuples as we're processing them, we may end up with, uh, may, may provide us with additional benefits. And some of the things we'll be able to do are things like removing duplicates, uh, doing uh, aggregations with the group buys, and then also bulk loading, uh, bulk loading keys into an index. So why am I even bother talking about sorting, right? Because everyone here has basically taken CS 101 or whatever the equivalent is at your undergrad institution, right? If everything fits in memory, we can just use quick sort, heap sort, merge sort, whatever your favorite sort is, and we're done, right? There's nothing, you know, there's nothing magic in a database system that'll make one sorting algorithm for an in-memory uh, workload be better than another, right? The thing that we're going to focus on is when it doesn't fit in memory. Right, that's the thing that they don't teach you in like in you know, intro CS class of when you have to spill a disk, because right, that's now these certain algorithms like quicksort, for example, is not actually what you're going to want to use, because quicksort is all about doing random access. It assumes everything in memory, so you can swap things, and who cares, right? If, if you know if you assume there's no I/O, but now in a database system we need to be mindful of this because we need, may have to spill a disk. So that's what we're going to focus on today, and so the particular algorithm we're going to focus on is called external merge sort. So this is the most frequently used external sorting algorithm in every single database system. The, maybe the exact naming of the phases or the exact protocol or methods for each step may be different per system, but at a high level they're all going to be doing basically the same thing. So it's a sort of a hybrid strategy where in the first phase we're going to sort, the, uh, sort our input sequence of keys into small sort of runs that can fit in memory. And then we may spill them to disk, because we may not have, not, not have enough space. And then in the merge phase, we're going to start combining these sort of runs into progressively larger and larger file sizes that again, could get spilled to disk. And at some point, we repeat this, this, this merging process until we have the entire sequence sorted. Right? Again, think of like what we talked about before in that the the database system is going to try to maximize the amount of sequential access it can do to read and write data because you know, it, it's assumed that sequential access is much faster on a disk storage system. So the algorithm is going to favor doing sequential access doing, versus random writes, which is what the quick sort would actually do. So we're going to start off talking about the, the simple example of, of what's called a two-way two -way merge sort. So two-way would mean there's two sorted runs we're going to merge together. So We'll later generalize this to do a k-way external merge sort. We, we can merge k different runs together, but it's easier to start off with just two. So what we're going to do is we're going to say our, our file or key sequence, the thing we want to sort, uh, will be stored, broken up into n pages, and that we're going to restrict the database system to only have b number of fixed size buffers that it can use to store, store these sorted pages. So again, think about the irreparable assignment that you guys built. You can't store everything in your bubble because you run out of space. So you want to restrict how much memory you, you, you're allowing the system to, to, do, to do the sorting so that it doesn't blow away the buffer pool every single time you need to do a sort. So the high level of the algorithm looks like this. So in pass zero, we're just going to scan through all our pages, uh, uh, every B pages into memory. And for each page, we're going to sort them, just, just that page, just the values in that page. And then we're going to write that out the disk, right? And so these sorted pages, these, like uh, uh, will be called runs or sorted runs. So at first, the size of the of the at, the at the first pass, the size of the runs will be one page because I took a page into memory, did quick sort to sort that, then wrote it out. Then in the subsequent passes, we're going to go back and we're going to recursively merge pairs of sorted runs together. Doesn't matter which, which ones we, we, we're going to pick, right? You can try to be intelligent. We'll see an example. But in, in practice, I don't think anybody actually does this. Uh, 
and we're going to merge them together and produce a new sorted run that's twice as big as the input runs that, that we, we merged together. And then we keep doing this until we till the whole thing is sorted. So for this algorithm, we're only going to need three buffer pool pages. We need one page, two pages for the input for, for our two runs, and then one page for the output, because we have to always write it out. So again, at a high level, it sort of looks like this. Say that we have our database on disk, and we have two, two pages, and they're unsorted. We're going to fetch the first page, sort it, write it back out the disk, fetch the next page, sort it, write it out the disk, and then we'll fetch the two pages together, and then write the first, you know, combine the, the first, combine the two together to make a new page, then combine the second page, two together to make the second page. Right? At a high level, this is what we're doing. So, it's a, this is considered a, a divide and conquer strategy, right? Because essentially what we're doing is we're, rather than trying to merge, sort everything, which is what quicksort would want to do, we're going to sort smaller chunks, and then we're going to combine it together as, as we go along, and being smart about how we read and write data up. <coughs> so, let's say this is our input sequence, and we have a little marker here at the end to say we have the end of file. So, in the first pass, we're just going to take each page and just run quicksort on it and sort that, and then write each of those pages out. Then in the second pa pass, we take two adjacent pages, combine them together, and then write those out. So again, what I was saying before is that we don't, we're not, we don't need to be smart and say like, oh, well, I know that this one starts with a three and this one starts with a one, so maybe I want to merge these two guys together. You don't have to do that. I don't know if anybody actually does that. In practice, the algorithm just works okay as it is. You can say, all right, this, these two guys are next to together. I'm just going to merge them together. Right? And what will happen is the reason why you, uh, we only need three pages to do this is because as I, as I say, start with these two guys here, as I'm scanning them, I just do a, you know, a comparison versus wherever my cursor is on the first page and where my cursor is in the second page. And then whatever one is, is less gets written out, and then that cursor moves down. And I never have to backtrack. Right? So I never have to maybe scan down one page and then have to go back and, and, and fetch it again. As, I, as I'm doing my comparisons, my cursors are moving down, and I'm writing these pages out, I never have to go back. So I only need two pages, or two pages for input, one page for output. And if the, if the page I'm writing as my output gets to, gets, you know, is full, then that gets written out the disk, and I just start, start a new page. Continue down, the third pass, same thing, we combine them again, and then we get down to the bottom here. And we have our completely uh, sorted, um, sorted sequence. So for the two-way merge sort, the, the algorithm for determining the number of passes we're going to need to do is 1 plus this, the ceiling of log 2n. So the total I.O. cost, the number of pages we have to read and write, compute this algorithm, to, for, to this, this sorted sequence, is 2n times the number of passes. Right? For each pass, we've got to do one, for every page we have, we have to read it in and write it out. So that's why it's 2n. The first n is for the read, for the second n is for the write. And we do this times the number of passes that we have. Pretty straightforward, right? Yes? So what happens to the intermediate pages? This question is what happens to the intermediate pages? So say you're like here, and I, I combine these two guys and I sort them. Like, again, think of it like you have a cursor here and a cursor there. And they're saying, all right, what's, what's the first two keys I want to compare across these two runs? So this one would be 2 and this one would be 4. 2 is less than 4, so I write that out to my output page. Then the cursor moves down by 1. So then I compare 3 and 4. Well, 3 is less than 4, so 3 gets written out and that cursor moves down. Now we get 4 to 4, and then you flip a coin. It could be one or the other. It doesn't matter. So you're sort of... You're populating one output page at a time, and then when it's full, it gets written out the disk, and you just start with a new fresh page. And then you, and you maintain some internal metadata to say, all right, for this sort of run, page one, two, three, and four can be found here, right? Going that sequence. They may not, may not be contiguous in memory, but in, or, sorry, on disk, but in practice, you would want them to be. Yes? Where does the what, sorry? So where does that one come from? Oh, this number of passes? Because uh, you, you always need the first pass. You always have to go through it once. That's unavoidable.
right? Like again, and then this is just dividing it by, you know, you're having the, the having the number of, of sorted runs you have as you go down. So you need one one pass is always to go through it the first time. Question here or no? Okay. All right. So again, this particular algorithm only requires three buffer pages. Uh, it turns out if you have more than three buffer pages, you're actually not going to get a good performance because um, you're not going to effectively be utilizing them. Uh, so I don't want to go into details of the, the the general merge sort algorithm, other than to say that the here's what the math looks like. The basic idea is that you instead of computing the the number of passes based on uh, two, you you base it on the number of runs that you have. And now essentially what you're doing is for every single pass, instead of merging just two runs together, now you're merging k runs together. And the algorithm essentially works the same way. Every run that you're combining together, you have a cursor, you do comparison across all of them, and then which whenever one is the smallest, that gets put in the output buffer and you move that cursor down by one. And so in general, the, the formula for determining the number of passes you have to do is one plus the ceiling of log b, b minus one and the ceiling of n over, over b. And the total cost of that, again, is two times the number of passes. That's always going to be the same. OK? Again, th this is almost a plug and chug kind of thing. Um, doing a simple example, I'm not going to go through actually all of this, but this, this will just walk you through how the, the math works out. OK? And I think there's a homework that, that basically does the same thing. OK. So we can actually use B trees to speed things up. Uh, but we're going to have the same distinction that we had before, whether you have a clustered index or an unclustered index. Um, the, in general, if you need to do sorting and you have a B plus tree available to you that is, that is indexed on the key you want to sort by, then the, every data system is always going to try to use that instead of doing the, the external merge sort. right? Because um, the way you think about this, you're paying an upfront cost of maintaining the index's inner nodes to, main, to, to sort of bake into the index the, the sort order along the leaf nodes. You're already paying that cost to maintain that sort ordering in the index. And so that's why it's going to be faster to use that instead of, instead of actually computing the, the sort order on the fly with external merge sort. So in general, the optimizer is going to be smart enough to recognize, oh, I have an index on the thing I want to do order by. So let me use that instead of actually doing the doing the, the merge sort manually. But again, they can only do this if you have a clustered index. So this is what we talked about before. Right? So if the, if the records we need to read are sorted in the order that are specified by the index, then we just jump to where we need to based on the leaf page and just scan across, and we're good to go. We know the output is already sorted in the order that we want. Right? There's, not, there's no extra step we have to do. In the case of the unclustered uh, B plus tree, like a secondary index, right? These sort ordering is all over the map, so we may end up doing more I/O, uh, you know, than we would have if we just did our external merge sort. So these kind of formulas that I'm showing here, this is essentially what the query optimizer is going to do in the database system. It's going to recognize, oh, I have an index, but my my it's it's unclustered, um, and I I have this amount of memory I can use from to do my sorting. It can use that to make trade-off decisions about whether it's better to do the index scan on the unclustered index or just do the external merge sort. And this is the beauty of SQL declarative languages. This is not something you as the programmer have to know about. The system just does it for you automatically. It's not going to always get it right, but in, in general it's going to be better than what any human can do. All right? So in this example here, we talked about how to, uh, when we talked about the, the query processing stuff, how if I could recognize that, oh, I'm going to fetch these pages, uh, these tuples in the different pages, maybe sort them by their page ID, so I'm having, you know, uh, reusing every page I fetch, fetch in. But if you do that, now you ruin the, 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 the sort order. So you have, again, you have to maintain some extra metadata to put it all back in the correct order when you're done. And at that point, you might just be, again, better off just doing the external merge sort. All right. So now we know how to sort. What can we do with it? Right? Obviously, again, order by is easy. If the user asks for that, we, we, we have to sort it so we, we, can, we can use that algorithm. Um, but we can use it for aggregations as well. So how would you use it for the aggregation? It's pretty straightforward, right? So say I'm doing a distinct 
uh, on, on the course ID here for this query. So the query plan would first go do a sequential scan on the table, apply the filter on, on, that's in the where clause, then do a projection to remove any columns that we don't want, and then now do our sorting to sort the, the, the keys that they want in the output. And then now we just have a cursor walk through this sort of output and maintain the uh, uh, a little buffer that says, what's the last value that I looked at? So that if I come across a value that I've seen before, then I know it's a duplicate, and I can just skip it and not include it in my output here. So this is advantage, again, this is another example of where sorting can be used for something not just for order by queries. You can do it for making internal operations go much, much more quickly. So this is pretty common. A bunch of systems will actually support this. Um, but actually, the most common way to do aggregations is to, to do hashing. So if you don't care about things being ordered, then running maybe the external merge sort algorithm it would be just too expensive. And a cheaper thing to do is actually just do hashing. So we can use the hash table stuff we talked about before and use that to compute our aggregations. So the way to think about this is like, say in this example here, if I had an order by clause on course ID, then it'd be a no-brainer to do sorting for this because I need to just get it sorted anyway, and I, I can just reuse the sort order to then illuminate the duplicates. But if I don't care about, about sorting, then I may want to use hashing. Right? Hashing, hashing is going is, is to add some randomness to our output because every time we hash a key and put it into a hash table, you, know, you remove all sense of ordering that, that from, from the data that it came from. So if we don't care about the sort ordering, then hashing is always, almost always going to be superior. So the way we're going to compute aggregates with hashing is that we're going to populate this ephemeral hash table, this in-memory hash, or not in-memory, we're going to populate this hash table that only lives for the execution of that query. Remember we talked about data structures earlier, and we said that it can be used in different ways. You can use it for table indexes, you can use it for metadata, you can use it for transient data structures. So this is, this is an example of a transient data structure. For our one query, we're going to build a hash table, populate it, compute our aggregate, and then throw it away. And every, if we execute the same query over and over again, we're going to rebuild that hash table every single time. So we build, we're going to populate this hash table, and then depending on what the aggregation we're trying to compute, we'll do different things with, with, with the values we're storing in the buckets. So if we're doing distinct, if we, if we see that we have a match, a duplicate, we just throw away, ignore the whatever we just put, put in. If we're trying to do a group by, with, with an aggregation function, then we can summarize the value on the fly as we go. So again, just like in sorting, if everything fits in memory, then we can just use any of the hash tables we talked about before, and we're done. Right? The, the linear, linear probe hashing, extendable hashing, uh, the cuckoo hashing, all those were in-memory data structures. So if our data set fits in memory, then we're, e we're fine, we're easy. But if it's a really large data set that's not going to fit in memory, then we need to be smarter just like in the, in the sorting case. So the hashing aggregate is going to have a two phases. First phase, we're going to partition the tuples into buckets, write those out to disk. And then the second phase, we're going to bring those buckets back in and then populate an in-memory hash table for just that partition or just that bucket and then compute whatever it is the aggregate that we want. Right? Again, we have to split a disk. We have to do this. If we're in memory, then we don't. So in the first phase, we're going, to use a, we're going to use one hash function. Doesn't matter what it is. Remember hash, ACD hash, doesn't matter. Um, and then we're going to do our scan over our input tuples. And then whatever key we want and we're going to group by, we hash that, and that tells us what partition uh, that we're going to write into out on disk. So we're not writing into a, a hash table at this point. We're just writing into output buffers that get written out the disk. So the idea here is by pre-partitioning is that we know that when we come back and read things back into memory to compute, to compute our aggregation, there's never going to be a time where we have to go get data from another partition to compute the aggregate, because everyone's going to get put into to the, the same, same location that, that have the same values. So if we go to our example here, right? same query as before. We do our filter. We do remove the columns. And then now at this point here, we're going to go scan through these values take our hash function, apply it, and then write out whatever the values are to, to our buckets here. Right? And we can be a little smart and recognize that, um, actually in this case here, you, for 445, there actually should be duplicates. You're not doing anything smart here. You're just taking the, the values and just writing them out. Because it may be the case, again, if I have a billion tuples, um, 
I may not, you know, the, the first tuple that goes in this bucket may be 15,445. And then a thousand tuples later, I see another 15,445 that I want to write out. But I don't know about the other one because I'm not maintaining any metadata about what I've seen in the past uh, uh, to, to make decisions about what to filter out. So all these buckets now get, get written out, right? And they're sort of grouped together in partitions. And then for each of these partitions, we're going to bring it back into memory. And we're going to build an in-memory hash table. It can be any, whatever your favorite hash table is, right? Extendable, linear, cuckoo, it doesn't matter. And then we're going to use another hash function to hash it into the hash table and then do whatever operation we need to do based on what, what our aggregation is, right? If it's a distinct, we filter out duplicates. If it's a uh, group by aggregation function, then we compute that. So this, we're going to assume that the partitions, as we bring them in, will fit in memory. It's not always the case either, but we'll see how to handle that when we talk about hash joins next class. So, for, so the way to think about this is we're assuming that our input data doesn't fit in memory, but as we partition it, then each partition will fit in memory. And this obviously assumes that we have uniform distribution after hashing, which is not always true either. But for simplicity, we just assume this is the case. So here we're back now in phase two. These are the partitions that we generated from the last time. And for simplicity, we're just going to combine them into a single hash function like this. right? And the, ha the keys are just the hash keys. And then since we're doing distinct, we're just maintaining the values inside of the, the hash table. So as we're scanning along, if we see that we have a duplicate, Right? We can just throw it away. And then the final result we need to produce for the query is just the values that are stored in the hash table itself. Right? So again, what would happen is as we go along this phase, if we hash 1545, we see that there's already a, a tuple here with the same value. We can just discard it. So essentially, we're doing a linear scan inside of the value list for, for that particular key, which we know how to do for hash tables. For summarization, uh, the idea is that you can maintain a running total as you go along and store that as, as, your, as your value in your hash table rather than just the, the, the existence of the key. So again, the idea is that in the second phase, when I rehash, if I do my hashing and I, I see that uh, I do a hash on the group key, I land into a bucket, and I, I find the entry that corresponds to my group by key, and then I just do whatever operation I need to do to update the total for that that function. So again, let's say we go back to this query, a different query, where we're doing a join on student enrolled, and we're getting the average GPA of the students in the course ID for each course ID. So now, when I, in the rehash phase, when I build my hash table, in the value list, I'm going to have a mapping from the group by key because we're grouping by course ID to some running total we have to do to compute the function. So the the table sort of looks like this. What you actually need to maintain. So if you're doing average. It's a pair of count and sum, because at the end, you just take the sum divided by the count, and that gives you the average. For min, max, it's sort of obvious to maintain the, 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 the largest value you've seen. For sum, it's just adding, adding it to it. Count is just adding one. So this is how the data is going to maintain inside the hash table the aggregation function as it goes along. And then as it scans through each of these, it, it populates this. And then when it's done, that's the answer that it, it, it produces as the final output. So is this clear? Right? Again, pretty straightforward, but it's kind of cool that we're building on the crap we did before, right? We talked about how to build hash tables. Now we can use our hash tables to do aggregations. Or we can do, use, use sorting to build aggregations, do aggregations. Right? Just sort of building the layers of the system on, on top of each other. So the cost analysis for this is essentially uh, if you have B, B buffer blocks you can build, then in the first phase, you can always spill out B minus 1. Right, because you, you you always need one partition to be able to you know to use the buffer to write out to, um, and then on the coming back in, the total number I, amount of I/O you have to do will be times b minus one, because for every single page b, you have to read it back in, write it out, and read it back in. So I don't want to talk about the fudge factor here, but again, the, the big assumption we're making is that the keys are going to hash uniformly, so each bucket has the same amount of data. In practice, that's not always the case. Right? There's more people live, live in Pennsylvania than people live in Alaska. So if you hash on the state, you know, the, the Pennsylvania bucket is going to be over, overflowing. We'll cover that next class when we talk about hash joins, because this is the big problem that these guys are going to have to deal with in, in their environment, of how to deal with uh, joins when everything isn't uniformly distributed. Okay. All right, so 
The, the main takeaway when you get from this, and we'll see more about this on, on Monday next week, is that then the data system has to, have to maintain this trade-off of making this, this decision about whether to use sorting or hashing. And it depends on what index you have available, what the data looks like, what your query looks like, and, and then uses that to figure out whether one choice is better than another. I will say the spoiler is, for if you take the advanced class, is that hashing is almost always going to be the better approach. Uh, unless you have an order by that explicitly wants your data sorted, hashing, whether it's hash join or hash aggregations, is almost always better. Right? Sorting is just, it's just more work. Um, there's a bunch of other optimizations we talked about before, about prefetching and, and, and trying to do as much work as you can for every I.O. you have to do. Um, the main takeaway from all of this would be that everything, all the optimizations we focused on were all about how to reduce I.O. Once I got the thing in memory, I didn't, you know, I don't really care, you know, what, you know, sorting algorithm I'm using or, or, you know, how, how, what, what cache friendly approach I'm using to compute my hashes. I don't care because the disk I/O is always the most expensive thing. So that's what I want to minimize. In the advanced class or in an in-memory database, disk I/O is no longer the issue. So now we start caring about things like CPU register usage, cache utilization, and other things. For this, again, you could come up with a better hash table that, that's cache friendly, but for, since the I.O. is always going to be the biggest problem, we don't care about that for this class. Okay? All right, so any questions about sorting or aggregations? All right, cool. All right, so next class, again, we'll be focusing on joins. Uh, so we'll start with the basic nested loop joins and then just get more complicated and complicated. And then we'll have time, we'll talk about what I call exotic jo joins, lateral joins, anti joins, semi joins. Right, but we'll get through the basic join algorithms and see how much time we have at the end to talk about more fancy things. Okay? <laughs> That's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes! It's the S T Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I could do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. You homies on the cut, so yeah, I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watts, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a 40. A six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>